So here's our Mr. Furness's Retirement Planning Committee meeting kickoff. And I'll give you all some context. Uh, predominantly, we're gonna be focused on heating and, and air conditioning, but predominantly in single phase applications. So that's gonna be, of course, residences, but it also may be apartments or assisted living facilities, that kind of stuff. Um, it has other broader commercial applications, but that's the uh, predominance of the meeting today. So with that, a little background. This is something I was uh, looking up the other day. It's about um, decarbonization. And while that is not a subject that we hear a lot of in Wisconsin, on the coast, it's um, a big subject. In, particularly in California, they really don't want Pacific gas on um, in buildings. And it's much tougher to get gas now. Um, there's a big movement to have more of our utility go through the power plants and not so much that, you know, we could debate all day long whether gas or electric is better because of efficiency for the power plants, but it does create better opportunities for using renewables, so PV, PV and solar and wind and all that kind of stuff. So Amazon's obviously making uh, a big commitment in that front. Um, Bill Gates has invested uh, in this little caper, I would like to get the fan order on this job, but this is for um, uh, sucking in air and pulling the carbon dioxide out of it through a chemical process and, of course, pushing it back into the atmosphere. We would have to build an awful lot of these to create the decarbonization effect, but um, it's obviously you can see it's um, a pretty, pretty significant industry. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, uh, we're gonna talk about heat pumps and, and it's sort of relative uh, com competitor, which is the furnace and can we use it and what's the story behind it. We're gonna talk about our new supplier, GRI, and their new compressor technology, which is new-ish. Um, we'll talk about costs. We'll put our costs out there so people can evaluate and something on operational costs as well. So here we go. If we lived in British Columbia, Seattle, that part of the country, we might see advertisements that look like this. You know, hey, Mr. Homeowner or Miss Homeowner, instead of having a gas furnace, you could get yourself an electric heat pump. And the operational cost would be very similar, but look at the impact that you can make in carbon footprint. So certainly people who drive a Prius probably also have an electric heat pump in their home. And that sounds great for British Columbia. You know, here's our furnace. We're, uh, if, if you guys all could use your reactions and uh, I'm looking for anybody who doesn't have a furnace. And you know what, I don't have my second page. Oh yeah, I do. Anyone not, put your thumbs up if you have a furnace in your home. <laughs> That's like the reactions tab. There's a, a lot, a lot, a lot of furnaces. Yep, yep. Sky, you have a furnace? Yes. Yes, you do. Okay. So on the left is our uh, fan favorite furnace. Uh, we know that we have to bring a gas line to it. We know we have to vent off of it. Uh, obviously, we need power. Um, that's without AC. And then on the right, uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, the Magic Pack or the Vertical Air Conditioning Unit. These are the two products that are incumbent in most single-family uh, dwellings. Uh, on the right, the Magic Pack is a little more for multifamily apartments. So here's our AC component of it, whether it's a heat pump or not, you know, pretty straightforward. We're in the business of compressors, outdoor units or condensing units, indoor units or evaporators, and using a fan and a thermostat. So nothing that should surprise anyone here. Now, my group hasn't sold heat pumps for a very long time, so I know for myself, I got periodically confused with the water source heat pump, the pond source heat pump, the ground source heat pump, and the air source heat pump. And for those of you who are non-HVAC uh, attendees, it's all basically the same thing and whatever you're dumping your unwanted BTUs into, whether it's the ground or a lake or a boiler tower or the air in this case. 
And I, I do marvel at heat pump operation in winter that uh, some of these units are capable of taking minus 10 degree outside air and extracting heat and forcing it into the home is just amazing. And I think we, in many ways, take it for granted, but it is some impressive technology. And of course, we're all familiar with the operation of air conditioning in the summer, so not a big surprise there. This is an interesting slide in that it's showing the rate of adoption of inverters around the world. So we look at Japan, sort of the mothership of VRF in inverter duty compressors. You look back in 2009, and it must be code because everything in Japan back in 2009 had an inverter. And of course, it makes sense that in 2017, and I'm over here on the map if it's hard to see in your computers, uh, China in 2009, very small amount of inverters has jumped to almost 70% as of the year 2017. I don't know where the data comes from. This is a slide from our manufacturer. I would guess it's probably right. In 2009, the inverter penetration in the United States, well, in North America is almost nothing. And our rate of adoption as of 2018 is really slow. So since inverters are making their way around the world, you have to wonder, well, why hasn't the United States really done a great job of adopting? It's probably a handful of things. Number one is our utilities are not particularly expensive. Uh, Europe is far more expensive. You look at Europe as at 90 some odd percent as of 2017. And a lot of the US companies that build air conditioning aren't really specialized in inverters. So you think of train and carrier and the like, they make staged compressors or single stage compressors. So maybe it's not that big of a surprise. The rest of the world is ahead of us here. So who is GRI? GRI is the manufacturer that's producing the product that we're marketing today. Um, maybe you've heard of them or bumped into them, but maybe not familiar with them. Uh, it may surprise you to learn that GRI is the largest HVAC manufacturer in the world. You know, we, we get to these meetings and, well, we invented this, we were the first to market with that, whatever. They're just plain the biggest. And it's pretty easy to see that they're the biggest when you consider that they're capable of making 60 million residential air conditioners in a single year. 55.5 million, it looks like, it's not a very compelling slide over here, but that looks like packaged AC or maybe rooftop units. Uh, 90,000 employees, lots and lots of engineers. And when I think of Chinese manufacturing, I don't always have a very strong impression. I think of, you know, I hate to say it, but sort of a sweatshop. Or uh, I think of Apple sometimes too, where a lot of their sourced manufacturing is in China. Um, these guys are pretty sharp. Lots and lots and lots of pets. Um, I did, this is a longer video that's been cut down. Um, and I have to make sure to keep some, hopefully this pops up. Um, it's only 50 seconds, but you can kind of get an idea. Like this should give you some impression that when a company makes its own robots, they're probably capable of making air conditioners pretty well. I got some stuff stuck I see some stuff So now, candidly, I, I haven't been there yet. We just 
uh, signed the contract with them a few weeks ago. Um, but it, there aren't a lot of people there. I've heard of Lights Out Manufacturing. This seems to be as close to it as I've ever heard of before. So um, moving on a little more techie, if um, when, when Refrigeration Ron first came to Airflow and we talked about using heat pumps and the cost of heat pumps and operating heat pumps and what's more efficient in COP, you know, um, when we've presented VRF and heat pumps to folks, they're like, well, look, gas is so cheap, you can't possibly heat with electricity and be competitive. And so let's just do the math real quick. Um, if you're looking at a furnace, for example, 95% efficient furnace, and the cost is 60 cents a therm, which is 100,000 BTUs. And we're oh, let me back up just a half a sec. Talking about a three ton, so a 36,000 BTU unit. And for a heat pump, we have to know the temperature to get the rating for it. So back to the gas, because we're not going to be using gas at the heat pump. This is the comparison. We have to produce 36,000 BTUs per hour. So 0.36 therm, corrected for its efficiency, 379, cost 23 cents an hour to produce that amount of heat. Conversely, the heat pump, and I'll show you the table here in a second, 4,800 watts. Now, if you think 4,800 watts, it's a pretty big electric wall heater, for example. 4.8 kW, uh, 13 cents a kilowatt hour residential rate, costs 62 cents versus 22, 23 cents. Well, that's two and a half times as much. So should we, we could end the meeting now because the answer is it does cost more to heat with electricity. But what I'm going to share with you is there's a payoff till for sitting till the end. So we're going to get there, but we acknowledge that it's more expensive to heat with electricity than it is with gas. Okay, and here's that data table. What's interesting about this data table is it goes from 60 all the way down to minus 22 for the outdoor temperature. So when you look at a heat pump uh, ratings table, same, this looks the same for VRF. We're gonna look at the temperature, we're gonna look at the output. So this three ton, 36,000 BTU per hour unit can produce half the heat compared to the, um, the rating, but it's at minus 22. So yes, the unit D rates, it's still more efficient than electricity, but we just don't have a lot of bin hours here at minus 22. And we're going to get into a little bit more detail on that as we go along. So the data I took for this example, 4,800 um, watts to produce 36,000 BTUs with a COP of 2.2. So it still is derated to some extent at zero degree or zero Celsius, but it's still more than 2.2 times the efficiency because of the way that the a refrigeration cycle works for us. Okay, so this is a great map I found. Uh, if you live in Mississippi or Louisiana or Texas, you're probably very familiar with heat pumps. Why? Well, um, for a new installation, you can do all your heating and all your cooling with the same unit. Because of your weather data, you're really not going to bump into a lot of times where the heat pump is going to struggle. So now this light blue part of the country has some heat pumps in it. For example, I have a, a friend in Kansas City, and he said about half the installations in Kansas City are heat pumps and the other half are furnaces. Why? Well, because there's moments when it gets kind of cold here in the central strip of the country and the heat pumps can't produce enough heat. So where we are, there are really no heat, there are not a lot of heat pump sales because it gets so cold that the heat pumps fall off. We'll talk about why a little bit more and when we get to the compressors, okay? So what we have to do in these advanced technology plus supplemental heating zone is we have to add heat or we got to come up with some magic. This is not our first attempt, Airflow's first attempt at moving heat pumps in the market. We sold Samsung for a few years and we had some success with this um, single phase product that they call Max Heat. And it's a real, first of all, Samsung's a fantastic product. 
and it can produce heat at minus 13 and has 100% capacity at five degrees. So pretty cool. And Mitsubishi, a lot of folks are familiar with Mitsubishi, 76% at minus 13. I put some sizes on there because uh, it seems like in air conditioning, you get the very best rating instead of the very worst rating. So it's really important to not take the marketing pieces uh, that rate across the board. It's probably for their smallest size. And as they get larger, their output drops. Uh, the same thing is true for Greek. So when you're looking at marketing data, make sure you're backing it up with the engineering data. But this is pretty impressive. So these companies are pulling heat out of very cold air. Unfortunately, this happens. So we can't just say, well, you know, this is the polar vortex wind chill chart. It's not exactly temperature, but you guys get the idea. We can't just rely on 76% of the heating capacity. Sooner or later, we're gonna have a life safety issue in those homes. So some workarounds that folks have used. Uh, I remember when Daikin first came to the United States with VRF. And there was a lot of trim heat around because those um, VRF units kind of, Ron's a, has a background with Daikin and their units couldn't keep up when it got to be about, I think minus four. So then you'd have a lot of baseboard heat. Other alternatives, I've heard about people putting their outdoor units in their garage and keeping their garages warm. Uh, we're not gonna be looking at that kind of a fix. We used to put the VRF outdoor units in little garages with doors that open and closed. You can have a little boiler in your basement, that kind of thing. In this case, um, when we're talking about apartments, doing dual systems, uh, if we're talking about large, large facilities, dual systems is so expensive. So there's not much payoff of like, ooh, I can get high efficiency rating with this, but then I have to dump another system on the top. So we need to avoid that. In the case of the product that we're talking about, we do have a little heater kit. And because of its high output and low ambient conditions, our heater's pretty small, which is really nice. And it probably won't run. And we'll take a look at that when we look at the energy model. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce uh, our second speaker, Jeff. And Jeff, I'll move the slides for you. Jeff uh, has a background in, he's put in a lot of furnaces, a lot of, um, a lot, a lot of furnaces, some magic packs. He also is our, um, uh, has plenty of experience doing VRF startup. Uh, he's kind of a jack of all trades. He's on our software team. He's on our engineering team. He's inside sales. He's doing a lot of the AC support. And a fun fact, Jeff is kind of a big guy, so make sure you're nice to him. Otherwise, uh, you might not like the results. But anyways, Jeff is going to talk about um, uh, just the furnace market and um, some of the things he's experienced as an installer and a service guy. Jeff, ready? Yep. Fire away. All right, just wanna to touch base quick on um, residential furnaces. Everybody here kind of said that they had one um, and there's a good reason for that. Um, availability being a big one. Um, you see supply chain on the list as well. All of the supply houses have their own lines. Um, all the contractors have those partnerships and relationships with those supply houses. So they're able to get these units um, at a moment's notice. Uh, service parts, um, all of the contractors have a service division and their vans are full of universal parts um, for all of these units. So there's a good reason why we have them. Um, they're competitively priced as well due to all of the uh, competition. Um, Go ahead, Tom. Sure. Um, reliability is a big thing with them. Um, we've known gas furnaces to be reliable, but we don't really have anything to compare them to. Um, and they are only reliable to a point. On the screen here um, are three pieces that are known for uh, nuisance service calls. Um, they always happen at two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday um, and can be pretty pricey to fix. The hot surface igniter, the condensate trap gets plugged up um, and the flame sensors get sooted up. Uh, with the Gree Altranix product, that's something that we can completely avoid. Go ahead, Tom. Um, another service call or nuisance is block vents. Uh, they can get plugged with leaves in the spring, the intake can, um, as well as ice buildup in the winter. With the Altranix unit by Gree, 
we can eliminate the venting and not have to worry about the aesthetics um, as well as the ice buildup. Um, just another couple of pictures showing some venting. Uh, on the left is a multifamily unit. Um, you see all the PVC pipes coming through the roof that uh, leads to more issues with roofing, uh, leaks and whatnot, as well as higher labor costs for install. Uh, we can eliminate all of that. Uh, the other big thing is gas piping. A lot of the uh, multifamily units are only running gas pipe for the furnace. Uh, everything else is electric. Um, that's a lot of infrastructure to add to the building. You can see here, this is a picture of an apartment complex. Um, this is one of two walls of gas meters and all of the associated gas piping with it can be removed with the uh, GRE uh, Altranix unit. Okay, so this is sort of a, our break uh, of background versus the next stuff, but you know, Mr. Furnace, there's been a lot of misters uh, along the way. And some of these I thought would be kind of a cute break, but uh, these, all these misters is, have fallen out of the, the mainstream. Um, can anybody name them all? Mom, you wanna take a stab at this? Do you know how to work your mute? Maybe not. Or maybe Scott? Uh, no, I couldn't do all of them. Uh, the first one is Mr. Ed. From 1955. And the yeah, next one is Mr. Mr. McFeely. Nope. Nope. That's uh, Mr. Whipple. Don't squeeze Mr. the Whipple, charm. Okay. And then Mr. Mr. Bubble, that was Bubble Bath. And mm -hmm. that's Mr. Peanut, Mr. Rogers. And I can't see the last one. No. You know, they, uh, the, whatever company owns Mr. Peanut killed him off this year, and now his kid has taken his role as the mascot of the peanut company. The last one is Mr. Magoo, sort of a nearsighted Oh, I can't see him. Yeah. Okay. Cartoon, yeah. Uh, these misters are still hanging around, including Mr. Furnace. Uh, Mr. T recently got a, a new Comic-Con deal uh, for a new action figure, so good for Mr. T. And I don't think... Uh, what was it Pixar really did a good job of bringing the Mr. Pa Mr. Potato Head back to the limelight. All right, enough silliness, uh, moving back on to the product. So here's uh, Gree's um, lineup, at least as it comes to this particular offering. So two, the smaller and the larger outdoor unit and what looks to be like an indoor furnace, but it's an indoor air handler. Um, so yes, maybe you're not familiar with buying stuff directly through China, but the stuff that you're used to seeing is on there. So like at home, your air handler probably has a big yellow sleeve with a piece of paper in it that says what the energy guide is. AHRI has certified all these products and Intertech has tested and uh, agreed that the output heating capacities that GRI is marketing matches up with what their catalog literature is. So that's all good stuff that we're familiar with. Here's the lineup. So interesting in that the two ton and the three ton is the same unit. And it's just, uh, you change output by a dip switch. The indoor air handlers uh, are a little bit different in that they did have a different expansion valve. Uh, they're all R410A and the SEER ratings are very, very high and they're all variable speed. So whether it's a new installation or whether it's a retrofit, it's pretty simple. So on the right is what a new installation air handler would be. Um, there's not a whole lot to it. It's a coil, it's a fan, and there's an electric box for power. If there, uh, an electric heater is required, the heater will go right behind this uh, box where the arrow that I've cut off would be pointing to, it'd be stuck in here. Um, if we're replacing uh, air conditioning in a home, we can convert to a heat pump. So we'd pull out the A-coil and put in a new one. This one's rated for higher pressure, um, but it's got a two-way expansion valve. So we're going to be doing heating with the heat pump as much as we can, and then you would have your furnace for backup heat if you didn't have the electric trim heater kit that we use with the indoor unit. All right. 
Uh, some more fun facts here. Uh, the fact that uh, R410A boils at minus 55 is still an incredible feat in my in my mind. That we can uh, use that we can use the outdoor unit as an evaporator and pull heat from it. I think is amazing. But the fact that it boils at minus 55 kind of tells the story. And you'll all have to forgive me as I muddle through this because uh, Gree doesn't tell us exactly how their compressor works. They give us all the ratings for it. But um, the big issue with compressors is, and you know, those of you who are in the business and do service know all this, but the compression ratio is really important. And when, you're, when it's really cold outside, the suction pressure drops like a rock, which increases your compression ratio. If the compression ratio gets to be too high, the unit gets to be too hot. So in order to manage the compression ratio and therefore the heat, they've taken this mid-pressure jet, which they take off of one of the discharge or the suction side, I don't know, but they do build up the suction pressure to manage this ratio and keep the heat down. And they've done a better job of it than anybody else in the world. And they've been doing it since 2012. So the output, for heating in this is the highest of any product that we're familiar with. So if we're worried about like, oh, well, you know, it's a new product. It's not that new. It's been around since 2012 when it first was introduced. There are about a million of these compressors installed around the world. They, all the equipment comes with a standard three-year warranty and the compressor comes with an additional five-year warranty. So we're up to uh, It'd be great if they use numbers, but you can read down here, total eight-year warranty period. So I think there's, you know, pretty safe to say they're confident in their design. So now, it's going to get cold per our earlier slide where we showed that polar vortex. Can we rely on the compressor alone? Not according to our design conditions. If we're at two tons and we're at minus five, we will have 99% of the heating capacity, which is fantastic. And maybe at that you go, all right, if our design condition was minus five, I'm fine with no trim heat. But a lot of um, uh, Milwaukee's minus 10 or minus 11, Madison's minus 15, Green Bay is upwards of minus 20. We're gonna need to consider this. So as we get larger, you know, we don't, we, like we, we said earlier, you know, first they said 80%, 78%. This is just for the two-ton module in the two, three-ton body. So maybe you'd feel okay at 78% output capacity with a two-ton unit. Depends on what your actual heat load is. But as you get bigger, we're going to need to put some supplemental trim heat in here. We're going to standardize on 8KW and cover almost everything. So all this. We get into a bunch of five ton units, which is rare for certainly for multifamily. We can get larger trim kit heaters. We just have to buy a lot of them. Okay, so some things that are different that maybe you are got to pay attention to. If you're doing a new residential install or a full on replacement, we need to, and we have trim heat. So with the AKW trim heater, our indoor unit may need some electrical work just something to keep in mind because we've got that heater to power up. Outdoor units, very similar to what air conditioning is, maybe some a little higher, maybe some a little bit lower, but we're not powering up off of the outdoor unit. So important to remember here. Uh, I know for my house, I don't need a 100,000 BTU furnace because we really should be at about, according to Dave, our resident energy engineer, about 15 BTUs per square foot. Why do I have such a huge furnace? I don't know, maybe that's like the, eh, the contractor's rule of thumb, um, but we, I should be able to get away with 30,000 square feet for a, a 2,000 square foot home. But generally you see 40, 60 or 100, they're generally oversized. Now this 15 BTUs per square foot makes a big difference because we're tighter on the heating side than we are when we have a giant gas furnace. So something to think about. Okay. Uh, Jeff, you want to handle this part? Sure. Okay. Uh, 
talk a little bit about the Altranix installation. Um, we are talking about inverter-driven compressors. If a lot of you guys are familiar with that, you'll know that normally they require uh, DC communicating voltage and a special thermostat. Uh, this unit um, is still using 24 volt protocol. Uh, so with that, we can use a standard heat pump thermostat, uh, nothing special, just anything off the shelf. Um, the liquid line or the refrigerant piping, um, assuming that the old unit was 410A, um, you can reuse it. Best practice is always to replace that. Um, and on the residential side, these quick connectors are becoming more and more popular. Um, Greed does offer an option for that. It's a flare fitting of sorts. Um, and the nice thing about them is that they are a pre-charged line set. Uh, so the trim charge for your line length is already figured into um, the line set. So there's uh, makes it a little bit easier for setup. Thanks, Jeff. Now, maybe you're thinking like, oh, this sounds nice, but I, I'll wait a couple of years until they've got a few installs under their belt. Uh, there are plenty of installs under folks' belts. Um, there are about 10,000 of these installed in North Dakota and Montreal. So maybe it's, I don't, we, we are not privy to all the circumstances surrounding it, but uh, my guess is they built a bunch of homes that didn't have a gas line and they needed to figure out how to get heat into these homes and this was the best product available. So example is it's minus 24 outside, very cold, and we're still maintaining temperature in this little bit. Uh, again, about a million installs around the world, but uh, in the tens of thousands in North America. Okay, so usually we don't talk openly so much about costs, but because there's such a big market already existing in furnaces and multifamily, I think people are just kind of comfortable talking about costs. So if you're going to do a new installation, whether this be an apartment, for a home, uh, the cost for the equipment uh, for two or three tons is 2,500 bucks. The outdoor unit only is gonna be 1,500 bucks. If you're following with the new install and you need some trim heat, here's the cost of the trim heater kit. Gets, uh, it's a field kit. Of course, you're gonna need uh, a thermostat, in this case, a heat pump thermostat, but it'd be a standard 24 volt, some of those, um, some of the other stats are very complicated to work with. So this is just your straightforward thermostat. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna need a stand to get the unit elevated over the snow line. And as Jeff recommended, a new line set. Maybe that's about right. Now you get, all you contractors out there, you probably have as good a feel as anybody for what these cost. Um, now this is not, these labor estimates are without, not including ductwork. This is more like a, a replacement setup. So if you're gonna do a, I'm gonna rip out the furnace and put in a new heat pump with trim heat and um, a new outdoor unit, probably one day, but you will need to use an electrician to power up the indoor unit. Um, if we're just gonna replace the um, outdoor unit and the heat pump coil and leave a furnace in place, I've got a day here, but Jeff has suggested to me a few times that a good tech should be able to do it in half a day because there's a lot of time of waiting for waiting to pull the refrigerant out and then put the refrigerant in, and in that time you could probably change out the coil and run a new heat pump thermostat. And then if you can, just replace the outdoor unit for air conditioning only and leave the coil in place, and that should certainly be less than half a day. That might be just a few hours. So. If you don't have a frame of reference, here's what we've got for costs for traditional AC and furnaces. Now, because it's, it's a little bit different, um, for example, in this four to five ton heat pump, our ratings table says 17. So we're saying for a four to five ton AC to compete, they can get away with 16 sear. If they, uh, we needed 18 sear to satisfy the owner or the project requirements. This $2,700 here would probably go up to at least $4,000. So you can see that compared to comparables, this new product is significantly less expensive. Sometimes, certainly in the multifamily market, we compete with code compliant products. So 13 sear, 
efficient furnace. So in that case, our outdoor unit is a little bit more expensive than what, you know, you might be able to get a two or a three ton unit for a thousand dollars. Our indoor unit and outdoor unit packaged against uh, a furnace would be very similar in cost. We need a trim kit, they don't, blah, 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 blah. It's kind of peanuts. It's a really small differential. Um, as we get into the larger units, the difference grows just a little bit, um, 3,500 and maybe as much as $1,000. All right, so now we've got this, um, we've got the costs. Um, if we're in multifamily and we don't need to bring gas there, we don't need to do vent, we could be way ahead on first costs right out of the gate. So, what else is left to talk about? Well, uh, it would be important to know how much it's going to cost to operate. And earlier in the presentation, we talked that it would be more to heat with electricity in the beginning. Let's see how that plays out against, this is a great, you know, sometimes you get lucky. I called up a, a friend of mine at Ring, Ring and Do, and I said, what would it take to do an uh, building model and an energy study for something like this. One of their engineers had already built it, which was great. So he was doing an energy star for his geothermal heat pump, and he had already built the model compared to the code standard. I don't even know if 95 or 92 is the code standard, but 13C or AC. And so he just added one more um, entry with our Ultranix system, which is kind of cool. So. We didn't play around with the utility cost, 60 cents a therm, 13 cents a kilowatt hour. His home was three tons and the home was in, is in Milwaukee and it's built. So first costs, uh, the geothermal heat pump is about double what the code compliant furnace and air, air cooled air conditioner were. And then our Ultranix, you know, everything else is the same. This is a full install, so with duct so $300 spread. Uh, maybe uh, the $300 spread would be offset by not running uh, gas or vent. Maybe it would go up a little bit for the electric consideration, but relatively inconsequential, this difference. So here's what the operating costs are on a monthly basis. Our blue here is the geothermal heat pump. And it makes sense because the geothermal heat pump operating cost is relatively flat over the course of the year because the ground temperature doesn't change that much. The needs of the space go up and down, but um, the, uh, the sink for the energy is the same. Our orange line is the code compliant furnace and air conditioner. So you can see that it rises up in the summer and drops in the fall and into the winter because of the gas cost. And we're switching our utility from electric to gas. So here's our all electric system with trim heat over the course of the year. Yes, it is more expensive to heat in January, about $100 more. It's more expensive to heat in December, about $50 more. February is getting to be a push. But look at all the operational savings over the course of the year. Because we're not only because we're uh, more efficient in air conditioning mode, but because we're using the heat pump year round, because we're using variable speed, we're keeping that load very similar. We're not banging on and off the compressors. So this is the model. When I asked the engineer to help us with it, I didn't know what he was gonna come back with. I was hoping it was close, but here's the results. Um, the cost to operate that uh, furnace and air conditioner over the course of the year, $3,400. And our Ultranix heat pump with electric trim heat is a little bit less. Um, you can see that it makes sense that his geothermal heat pump um, is operating at about half the code, code requirement. So unfortunately, uh, you know, that is not always available for everybody. This gap is available and there is a payoff in it. Now, looking back at this, if you're doing a retrofit or considering a retrofit, you can just lop that off and lop, when I say that, I'm talking about the extra cost of electricity in the heating months because you'll have gas furnace. So the heat pump stat will be able to enable the gas and you won't need trim heat. So 
the heat pump will operate as efficient as it can. When it falls below set point, the gas will be engaged and you'll be using 60 cents of therm to operate. So that, if you, we had 420, 520, 570, and maybe we get to about 600 bucks a year on three times. Awesome. Well, what does that mean? Well, wait, you know, this is like turning into Ginsu. I'm not done yet. There's a $300 rebate from Focus if it's over 16 SEER and it's for new or eligible and there's got to be backup heat. Not a mini split. No, mini split's not eligible. But this Ultranix would be. So $300 per residence for the owner. So if we're looking at retrofitting a three-ton front, and I have a half a mind to print up flyers and go around my neighborhood and say, hey, I've got a better investment deal for you than your broker can get you. Um, let's look at this. 1,500 bucks, we showed this before, your outdoor unit. You're gonna need a new heat pump coil. This is a good guess for the cost, 400 bucks, we'll have them. Uh, we talked about the stat. The raising the stand up, the line set. Uh, we feel like this should be a four hour job, $100 an hour. If you pay your guys 100 bucks an hour, awesome. Total uh, cost $25.50. Mark it up, $3,200 sell price. Now I'm here on the owner side, looking at this $3,200. Well, I'm offset $300 by the rebate. Here's my $2,900. If I can actually save that $600, my return on investment, 20%, five years. I think uh, money markets are getting maybe 1%. If your retirement account is, hasn't totally taken a, a massive hit, um, some years you can get six. So this is, please don't take out credit card debt to uh, pay for an air conditioning replacement, but short of that, it's a pretty good investment. Now new installation versus code compliant. Uh, we looked at this, this pricing before, 2,900 bucks versus 2,350. But uh, we may have a little bit more electrical work on this side, maybe, but the vent and gas could easily be well above 650 bucks. Now something to keep, them, keep an eye on, if the plumber's doing the gas, and you gotta make sure you're talking to the construction manager and get this credit out of the plumber's pockets and into yours. If you're doing the plumbing, great. I don't care, however that works out best. So now Mr. Furness, you know, we are, uh, can safely retire him. Uh, he can go to clown college if he wants to or start collecting stamps. Uh, a lot of guys he used to work with said they were gonna get on the, the senior pro tour. I don't know if any of them ever did, but Mr. Furness will have plenty to do with his retirement. And so as we're getting near the end here, uh, just a few thoughts about GREE because uh, they do have a fantastic Ultranix product. They make an awful, awful lot more and I just wanted to touch base on the things that if you're working with Airflow, you should definitely be considering uh, working with uh, us on these products. First is uh, PTAX. Uh, we haven't sold PTAX before. It's, there's, it's not a lot of rocket science here. Um, GREE makes about 70% of the PTAX in the world. Uh, our pricing is going to be extremely competitive. So if you're putting in a hotel, an assisted living wing that has PTAX, what have you, um, we will be eventually stocking them, but we're, we have a, a, a big investment in our first container that doesn't include PTAX. So there's only five sizes. We're only going to be uh, using the heat pump model, not the AC only. They will have backup heat. We just have to buy a lot of them. So after we get, you know, if it's 180 or 240 units per container, we'll probably get an order for 100 and then put the rest in stock. So we'll have them available for short notice. All right. Uh, the biggest part of their offering is the one to one mini splits. Uh, they've got um, the whole lineup, these, um, I love the flowers, right? So the can of the lilac, the violet, um, different sear ratings. Keep in mind that the sear rating is for their best version. So your 23 sear model may only be 20 sear when you get to the, the two ton. Uh, these two are ultra heat. So if you have a four season room, you can actually use it for all four seasons. Um, 
And again, we're going to be extremely competitive compared to what you're used to paying. A lot of companies rebrand GRE, put their own sticker on it, and sell it in the US. GRE hasn't really been in the United States before, so um, there's a big, big cost advantage for us and then in turn for our customers. But it's great news. This is not an ultra heat product yet, uh, but if you're considering uh, eliminating gas from a facility and you don't want to use an electric hot water heater, we do have a heat pump slash hydro box slash um, hot water heater system. So I don't know that this is going to take off like uh, wildfire quite yet until they get the ultra heat, but you can do an all electric building and take advantage of the COP that heat pumps generate. Agree uh, also has a not a full line, they're getting there uh, in ultra heat. So they have a six ton and an eight ton in three phase. Um, and they also have a, an ultra heat uh, single phase VRF heat recovery. So if, let's say you're um, instead of like the Freeport multis, if you want to have a single phase four ton, you can pipe four units in series off of one in single phase. So this would be um, either. Uh, straight up and down apartment building it could be, or it could be a home that they wanted individual units in the rooms instead of a, a furnace, for example. So we're gonna be with this three-phase product, it's only available in 208 three-phase now. So smaller projects, we're gonna be really, really cost competitive, but if you have a 400 ton system, you're probably not gonna be barking up our tree for a couple of years. Uh, smaller jobs, absolutely. And finally, uh, if you read my blog periodically, you may know that we put on a 114 kW solar system. This is a picture of it. This is our output from a few days ago, not bad for the month, you know, 15.48 megawatts as of, I got another week to go, it was pretty sunny, it might be up to 20. Um, GRI makes a solar direct VRF unit in both single phase and in three phase. So it takes the DC power that comes off the solar units. And what's cool about this is I got a very big grant from the feds and from Focus on Energy and I could have rolled the air conditioning into it. So Gree's the only one that I'm aware of that does a solar direct product. So kind of an interesting, there's a lot of it in Puerto Rico ironically. So anyways, with that Gree has an awful lot of stuff. Make sure you uh, talk to you, if you're working with our engineering department, talk to Dave, raise your hand, Dave, and Jeff, and Ron, um, for stuff that we can do uh, in air conditioning. And then of course, if you're working with our sales staff on uh, and your contractor, we're gonna be very, very competitive uh, with all the stuff that we have. So with that, um, really appreciate your time today. I want to know if there were any questions. Uh, please direct the installation questions to Jeff, unless you would like to embarrass me. I'm sure Ben and Scott have, at least have one, or Randy. Go ahead, Randy, I see you're taking your mute off. <laughs> I don't know if I have anything to say yet. I'm thinking about it. You're thinking about it? What are your first thoughts? I had a question, but I don't remember what it was. I put um, you on the spot. So, so you sell you sell the the coil for a retrofit. Yeah. Um. So I can do a dual fuel with a furnace. Correct. Okay. There was another call. Oh, I was going to ask about other fan coil choices. You only showed one fan coil. Do we have? Do they have a wall mount fan coil for for your multi port solutions? The multi-port solutions are fan coils, high static fan coils, wall mount units, uh, floor mount units, I think, ceiling cassettes, yeah, yep. Okay, because they didn't, didn't show any other fan coil solutions. There are lots and lots, and uh, Mr. Dennis, I'm sure, will follow up with you and make sure that you are well aware of all that is great. Okay. Sure. We do have an air handler kit as well. Yes. 
Others? Well, you're all allowed to leave after we have three questions. So I need two more. Ken's smiling because he knows I do this in all of our meetings, or many of them. Well, Tom, Randy just posted, uh, is electric heat available? Uh, is that, when we add the trim heat, is that single point power connection or is that an additional wiring point? Jeff, you wanna take that one? Um, it's going to be on the air handler, it's single point connection, if you pray. So the trim kit gets installed and then it's single point from there. Correct. Okay. All right, one more and you're all free to go. <laughs> oh, were there any more in the chat box, Ken? No, uh, that was the only one. That was the only one that I had seen. Um, Everybody's already on vacation, Tom. <laughs> Come on. Fine. What's the Fine. hey Tom, what's the what's the lead time on the product? Oh, that's a that's we're still working it out. So it, we have to buy uh via shipping container. So I think our lead time after order is about um 75 days. Does that sound right to port? And then a couple days to get here. So um we will have as time goes on, we will build up some inventory here for the onesies, twosies that we have. So we will, we have already placed an order for some Altranix units or, and some mini splits. In the future, we'll have PTAX and a wider offering. There also is a distribution center in, was it Pennsylvania? That has more of the three phase and the um, pieces and parts that go along with the indoor units for the three phase systems too. There's a few more that just came in here too, Tom. Um, yeah, this one is regarding our defrost cycle. Um, I, I thought we had a slide in on that, but I didn't see it in this presentation. Yeah, the, the question is, how do you guys deal with ice buildup on the outdoor unit in the winter? When it defrosts, does it just freeze on the ground? Yeah, Ben, it's going to operate very similar to a standard VRF system. So it's just going to defrost below, um, below the unit. And, and it's not really gonna, I mean, it's not gonna pool on the ground in a big puddle of ice. Okay. Are, you guys, are you guys gonna be stocking parts? Yes, yeah. So we're, we're sort of the, uh, we need to have quite a few parts because we're buying shipping containers that take 75 days. So um, that parts, we're matching parts with the equipment that we're ordering and so I, I believe we will have more than enough uh, with this first order and that parts group will get bigger and bigger. And they have some parts in, in uh, Pennsylvania too. Well, I guess that was three. Did that wrap up the chat questions? Oh, uh, Ben's got another one here. Um, Keep them coming, Ben, I like it. Really just 16 or 18 inches just to get us above the snow load is usually fine. If you're in a area where you expect more, obviously we can bump that up a little bit. There isn't anything in the literature um, as far as requirements. Um, we just got to make sure to use kind of best practices. Yeah, so if you're, uh, I know that that apartment market is very competitive and a lot of you know smaller contractors dig around in there this should give you a pretty big advantage if you can get the design in. or as a substitution for furnaces or you know maybe even magic packs all right well uh do we exhaust the questions jeff uh yep okay well, with that, uh, I will stop the share and just say, hey, I really appreciate everybody's time. Thanks for coming. And uh, make sure you talk to either our engineering team or your salesperson uh, if something comes up that this might work for. <laughs>